Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Okay, I'll call the July 17th, 2023 Alamance County Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Greg, I believe you have the honors. Thank you, Commissioner Carter. Uh, will you bow your hands with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to live in a nation where we can come together and discuss the important business of the community in a civilized and a respectful manner. We pray for discernment. We pray for wisdom. Amen. Would you please uh, stand with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. I'm going to make a motion concerning the agenda. I'll make a motion that we move item 6B per the request of ABSS uh, from the agenda tonight. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. No. I voted no. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, Public comments. Sorry, Bill, I didn't hear you. That's okay. <laughs> Not a problem. I need to turn my hearing aids up. Let's see. Peter Morcom. Oh, that would be me. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Morcom. I reside at 474 Thompson Road, Graham. Um, some weeks ago, I gave some of you a book called Managing, which uh, explains how uh, your difficult tasks can be done uh, in a way that might serve the community even better than you already do. Um, basically, I can't talk about the police, the fire department, the health department. One thing I can talk about is the school budget. And the school is run by experts, of course, and they don't really like to, you to know too much about what they're doing. So they only come to you when they're in trouble. And the, the thing is, they, what kind of trouble? Well, if they for, don't do the maintenance for five or six years, the roofs are leaking all over the place, and they come to you with a demand for seven, $27 million. That's a big surprise. It should never happen. And uh, the, the reason they get away with it is they're hiding stuff from you. They shouldn't be able to hide things from you. And the answer, of course, is to have the accountants report directly to you instead of to the school district or the sheriff or whoever. It's not a, I'm not getting at the school district specifically, although they are the, probably the worst offenders. Anyway, you can't afford to have people hiding stuff from you. It just, it, how can you manage anything? If you if they're hiding stuff from you, anyway, that's all I have to say. And thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart Smith. Oh, sorry. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. My name is Stuart Smith. I'm a resident of Mabin, 811 South Third Street. As with many citizens in Alamance County, I followed the recent county budget discussion closely until a tax rate was set. I'm thankful for the work of the commissioners who I felt were thorough and thoughtful in setting the tax rate. As with others in Alamance County, I monitor property tax rates across our regions and similar sized counties. If one looks close enough and digs into other counties' revenues, it is very revealing. Davidson County has held a county property tax rate of 54 cents 
for several years. At first glance, it looks like they have found the magic for holding a property tax rate in check. But have they? I did some work in Davidson County in 2014. During that time, there was much discussion about the need for a new high school. The decision was made by the commissioners to put the one quarter cent sales and use tax on the ballot. Although statutes are clear that commissioners cannot com campaign for this one quarter cent, they can't answer questions. The citizens of Davidson County understood that the new school was going to be built. The citizens understood that it would be built with a property tax increase or the one quarter cent sales and use tax. The citizens voted for the sales and use tax and there was no property tax increase. Thomasville citizens pay 63 cent property tax and a 20 cent school tax. The city of Lexington has a 12 cent school tax and a 65 cent property tax rate. As approximately one third of the population of Davidson lives in these two municipalities, you can see the county tax rate is only a portion of their citizens' property tax. Randolph County Economic Development Commission touts the fact that they have the fifth lowest rate in the 12 county Piedmont region. Where does Randolph County get its revenue in addition to property tax? Ashborough City Schools have a 14 cent school tax. Randolph County has enacted the quarter cent sales and use tax. This is a factor in enabling them to maintain their tax rate. As we move forward, I would hope that the quarter cent sales and use tax for our county would be considered again. I realize Alamance County has rejected this in the past. Many have stated to me that they did not understand this was to be paid for, the, needed to be paid for the new school. I just hope we explore all possibilities to fund our county's needs in the future without increasing property tax. And I have faith in every one of you that you'll do that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. James Walker. Hey, <coughs> sir. I'm here again about the trash down here. They are uh, going by my house, 60 mile an hour, 45 mile an hour speed limit. Trash when I come out to our driveway, come up here today. Tarp wouldn't come white pickup past me and kept getting up. I couldn't get him because I couldn't catch up with him. <laughs> he crossed 54 and kept going before I got there. But anyway, uh, my understanding, two of you voted for it and the three of you didn't. And so, could you take another vote on that, please, sir? And I appreciate it if you would. Maybe that change your mind if people go by y'all's house and throw the trash out after you mow the yard or before you mow the yard. Because that's what they're doing on Mount Willen Road, doing on Salem Church Road, and Mental Springs Road. I went down to see Mr. Hill today, and he, sa I, he said that uh, Mr. Johnson was taking care of stuff, and I'm gonna call the Highway Patrol. I got a few connections there with Highway Patrol. We'll call them and see if they can start doing something down there. Matter of fact, there's two highway patrolmen on a marked car down there in my road very shortly. And uh, so we're going to see if they can't do something about that. And I appreciate if y'all would take another vote. Maybe y'all would change your mind. Is that okay? <laughs> Walker, we don't make we don't respond to comments during, the, yeah. during this. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, I would thought I would ask you anyway. I appreciate it if you would and and do it for the people in Alamance County. It's on landfill down there. They blow up, throwing out toilets and everything else down there. You want to take a dump in the toilet? All you got to do is stop side the road. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Joyce. <laughs> well, I think I'd be here two times in a row. It's probably the last time in this lifetime. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm here to talk about one. The sales tax thing, you can just forget that. Look, the people voted no three times. I don't know how hard a head you have to have to understand that people are not going to vote for a sales tax increase. It's a classless tax. It affects the poor just like it does the rich. 
They're not going to vote for it. They voted no three times. I mean, it looks ridiculous to put that back on the ballot again. I mean, you're just going to get another no vote. You know, these people don't, they, they don't have the mass deals and everything to understand it. You say, okay, you do a tax and we'll pay for school. Uh, they just don't understand it. But anyway, the reason I'm here is because uh, little Tommy over here, you know, he printed an article in the paper about uh, what I had to say about the property tax. And I don't know if you guys took it seriously. Evidently, you did. Because if I would have been a commissioner, I would have been straight to that tax office and I'd say, let me see these examples that Mr. Joyce was giving. Obviously, we got a problem. Instead, they print in the paper that Target, uh, J.C. Penney, Belks, all those, all those places paid less tax than they did the time before. And then they listed Holly Hill Mall. Now, why would Holly Hill Mall go up? Does anybody in here know why Holly Hill Mall went up? Have you ever been by Holly Hill Mall? Have you ever been by Thomas? You ever been by Holly Hill? Have you noticed that they built the new Publix, two new strip centers? That's a separate parcel. Uh, okay, it's a separate parcel, but it's included in that valuation. No, it's not. Yes, it is. It's a separate parcel. I'm sorry, Mr. Okay. George. Well, I don't want to argue with you. With the, with the audience. Uh, but anyway, that's the reason that it went up. It's no question in my mind it's went up. Because if it wouldn't, they'd more be standing on top of that desk right there if it's probably got tripled. So, uh, you know, I mean, you need to look at this. And, you know, I don't come down here and ask you a question unless I already know the answer. I just want to see what your answer is and what the paper's answer is. But, you know, th this thing about the one cent increase in teacher's pay. A teacher makes $50,000 a year. And you're going to give them a one cent raise, okay, a 1% raise. What's that, $500? 500 bucks. Teacher's going to leave here and go to Orange County for $500? Do you want that teacher? She's going to leave here and go to a very liberal Orange County, a very liberal Guilford County, a very liberal Forsyth County, Durham County, Raleigh. They're going to leave here for $500. I don't want them teaching my child. If they're that dumb to get in a car and drive from here to Chapel Hill every day to make $500 more, buy. Because you don't need to be in the classroom. You don't need to be in any classroom. I'd rather have a guy with a two-year associate degree in business that would teach these kids how to make a how, how to take care of their life once they get out of high school. They don't need to know about CRT and all that stuff, you know. But anyway, that's my, my little speech. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Okay. Do we have a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor of the consent agenda say aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. And now I believe uh, Ms. Foxy Harper is up. How are you doing tonight? Pretty good. I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> it has been a while. Well, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to report to you on the work of the Senior Services Committee. The past three years have been pretty challenging since we've had to adapt to the results of the pandemic and the restrictions, and trying to return to normal has created a whole different set of challenges, marked most by fearfulness in our senior population and even uh, with some of our uh, providers needing to uh, ex express extreme caution with what they do. And so it, it has been a very um, difficult year or so with us trying to 
get back to business as almost usual. As you know, we're responsible for assessing the needs for services that enable seniors to remain in their homes and to maintain the highest level of independence possible. The committee prioritizes the 10 services we currently provide and allocates funding from the Home and Community Care Block Grant <clears throat> according to that prioritization. The services that we currently fund are home delivered meals, congregate meals, adult daycare, medical and general transportation, information and options counseling, care management and in-home aid, which consists of three levels of uh, services depending on the uh, needs of the recipients uh, of the care. Providing care and services in the home is very beneficial to the person receiving the services because they want to stay home. I don't think any of you that I'm speaking to would choose to have yourself placed into some facility, whether it be a family care home or uh, uh, assisted living or, or nursing. Our first choice is most of the time stay home. So the alternative to that is residential care in a licensed home, which is seldom anyone's personal preference. The fact that it is far less expensive to provide care in the home rather than in a facility should mean that more people in need of help could receive it. However, it is a constant battle to maintain existing funding and seek increases to meet the needs that the rapidly growing senior population creates. Our experience and statistics tell us that even one in-home service can make a major difference in someone's life. Imagine if you were confined to your home, unable to cook your meals, seldom had a visitor, receiving a hot nutritious meal five days a week delivered by a kind volunteer who spent a few minutes with you could make the difference between staying in your home and going into a facility. It also could make the difference between keeping you healthy and ending up in the hospital. And so that's an example of one of our services and its importance. I'd like to call your attention to some demographics from the Alamance, for Alamance County from the North Carolina Aging Profile. And that's the top document that you have. I'm not going to deal with the North Carolina side. The state statistics are on the other side, but just a couple of things with the profile here. In 2021, 25% of the county's population was 60 and over. And this age group is projected to increase to 27% of the population by 2041. At the bottom of the page is a list of social and economic characteristics of this same group. The poverty figures are important because they indicate that uh, the seniors who often need the services that we can provide are in that level of income. But there's more to the story. I'd like to direct you to the next handout, The True Cost of Aging. This is from a very reliable source. Kaiser is, is a, a source that does some really um, in-depth um, studies and, and uh, results. I'd like to point your attention to a few things in the article. I'm just gonna read a few paragraphs and ask you to take the time to read the rest because it's all valuable. More than half of older women living alone, 54%, are in a precarious financial situation, either poor according to federal poverty standards or with incomes too low to pay for essential expenses. For single men, the share is lower, but still surprising, 45%. That's according to a valuable but little known measure of the cost of living for older adults called the Elder Index, developed by researchers at the Gerontology Institute at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. 
Nationally and in every state, the minimum cost of living for older adults calculated by the Elder Index far exceeds the federal poverty thresholds, which are used to calculate official poverty statistics. One national example, the Elder Index estimates that a single older adult in good health paying rent needed $27,096 on average for basic expenses in 2021, $14,100 more than the federal poverty threshold of 12,996. For couples, the gap between the index's calculation of necessities and the poverty threshold was even greater. The statistics and the information in this report are very startling, I believe, and I think it's something that um, you all should take into consideration as you're planning for the future with the county and senior services. The reality of the actual poverty level and economic uncertainty faced by senior citizens today needs to be faced and addressed in adequately funding necessary services that many can't afford. This brings me to our own county's funding actions. Frankly, the Senior Services Committee was dismayed to learn of the cuts to Meals on Wheels, who provide home delivered meals, and the cuts were 51% for the home delivered meals and, and congregate meals uh, were cut by 46% from previous year's uh, allocations from the county. And it happens that Meals on Wheels recently uh, took on congregate meals added to their uh, home delivered meal services at the request of our committee and we tasked them with increasing meal sites in the rural parts of our county where there are no meal sites at present. But that's not going to be easy to do with that much less money. The waiting list for de home delivered meals prior to COVID was 60 to 100 and now it is at 140, the highest number that uh, Amanda, the director of that organization, has seen in many years. And I'm sure you're familiar with ARPA funding. That's coming to an end. And with that, they were able to just about clear the waiting list. Now, a sizable number of people uh, will be losing their funding for meals and with the loss of the money from the county added to the fact that grants and community donations are drying up. They don't know how they're going to make the difference. This is a basic life necessity that we're talking about, feeding people that are hungry. The 78% cut of funds to Alamance Elder Care, who provide information and op options counseling and care management services is having a drastic effect on their ability to provide services. The results are the loss of a case manager position, the increase in wait times because they no longer can accept walk-ins, the suspension of their volunteer program ends the home delivery of incontinence supplies and running of errands for seniors unable to get out of their homes, as well as their ability to give a small mileage stipend for the travel expense of the volunteer. Elder care has a wait list and serves seniors not eligible for Medicaid. Some have been on wait list for in-home aid services for three to five years. Now they will wait even longer. Our assurance of the commissioner's concern for our senior population has been shaken in light of these funding cuts. And in addition to that, the failure to assist Friendship Adult Daycare when the pandemic restrictions delayed their opening adds to our concerns. It was especially hard for us to process when the care uh, the center provided to a senior participant resulted in the gift to the county of a beautiful new building which houses the Friendship Center and two other agencies. For the past several years, the Senior Services Committee has been grateful for the faithful participation in our monthly meetings by Commissioners Amy Gailey, Steve Carter, and Pam Thompson. I believe that participation has promoted communication and understanding 
regarding the commissioner's duty to the senior population of Alamance County and what our committee does and how it operates. I believe they found it as valuable as the committee members did uh, having them present and having them available to help us understand the county uh, position on things. That connection's been missing lately, and we hope, Mr. Lashley, that you will join us in August when we begin to face the challenges of the new fiscal year. The committee will be working on gathering relevant data on the current needs for services in the county and considering whether we should add any other services to meet those <coughs> identified needs. Over the years, I've spoken to this body several times on behalf of the Senior Tar Heel Legislature and the Senior Services Committee. Never before have I been in the position of confronting the commissioners on behalf of the seniors I represent. I believe you need to hear the real consequences of your decisions in order to make more informed decisions in the future. I urge you to support your senior constituents who are not likely to fill this room in large numbers to advocate for themselves as some of the other groups have done. I'm here to speak for them and for our committee and to ask you to make caring for our seniors a high priority. Don't forget, they, we, are 25% of Alamance County's population. In conclusion, I'd like to introduce you to the new chairperson for the Senior Services Committee. Uh, Patricia Davis will be uh, the new chairperson. Patricia has been on the committee for three years. She's a retired grant writer for Duke University and lives in Mebane, and she'll be assuming her role at the August meeting. One thing further, any help you could provide in gaining new members <laughs> to be added to the Senior Services Committee would be very much appreciated. We recently lost three in one fell swoop, and uh, it, it, recruiting new members is an ongoing challenge but functioning with only five or six voting members is very difficult. So if you can do anything to help us recruit some new people, we would appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and to you. And I also included the Senior Tar Heels priorities for legislation for this uh, biennium. And if you have any questions, I do my best to respond. Thank you. Any questions? Ms. Thompson? I know how amazing they are. We just got to take care of our seniors because they made this whole world possible for us sitting here. Well, one thing that a lot of people don't think about is our seniors are living longer. They made their money working in mills, being a teacher, being a social worker, being a policeman, being in the military. And they made their money and put into their retirement funds back in the 70s and the 80s. They didn't make as much money as salaries are t uh, today for those positions. And certainly the dollars don't hold up uh, in today's economy. And so a lot of times people think, well, these are poor people that never did anything, that never worked. And that's not the case. These were people in a lot of situations that were very hardworking and did try to plan for the future, but the future uh, got away from them. And we may be in that position ourselves. You never know. So thank you. I'm a senior. Oh my gosh, how did that happen? <laughs> but I'm a senior, and within my own family, I've seen how just one certain thing can change, and it changes everything. Mm -hmm. it, what you thought was always going to be that way is totally different. So um, I, I think this the seniors are very popular. <coughs> we, we just don't we don't use often enough because brilliant minds are left. Just because you're retired, don't mean you're done. So uh, I, I just want to lift our seniors up myself. <laughs> Yes, and um, so next year will be the big 65. Oh, my God. <laughs> and we begin serving people at 60. As long as I can volunteer, I'm going to always be there. So I appreciate what you do. Thank I know you. how hard you work and how serious you take what you've done, and I can't thank you enough for being chairman. Thank and I know 
Miss Patricia's going to be awesome, too. <laughs> Thank you. You're there because you want to be. That, that's the best type of person. And, and we also have um, Angela Thompson here from the elder care, Alamance Elder Care, and Gail Miller, who is our current senior Tar Heel legislative um, representative. That's right. Angela Thompson could find a gold brick under a rock <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. That woman is so resourceful. Well, Ashley, uh, I just want to thank uh, the speaker for coming tonight and letting us know what you're seeing out there. And uh, thanks for bringing it to our attention. Because I was unaware of this. Of the percentages that you showed me, I was unaware of that. And I just thank you for bringing it up to our uh, attention. And we'll see if we can uh, do something about it. Thank you. Mr. Carter? Uh, nothing for me. Thank you, Ms. Hart. Well, I'm definitely not a junior member of this board, so uh, I definitely can relate to what you're talking about as well. So I appreciate what you said, and we'll take a look into it. Definitely. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Baker, you're up. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening. I have two items before you tonight, uh, seeking approval to acquire two different pieces of property. Uh, the first is a piece of property, it's actually two parcels uh, adjoining each other uh, in Mebbin that would be used for the future EMS station. So the action we're seeking tonight is approval to acquire these parcels and also approval to amend the budget to move the money from capital reserves where it has been set aside to acquire these two parcels. Uh, the purchase amount is $300,000 for this, which is based on an appraisal that we had in 2019, um, and they are combined 1.73 acres uh, situated on South 3rd Street, which provide very good access to corridors for our EMS folks. So if you have any questions about that item, I'm happy to answer them. If not, I'm seeking permission to acquire these. Okay. Mr. Carter? Nothing. Thank you. Ms. Thompson? There is absolutely no way that we can add on to our fire department stations a bay for an, for an ambulance. And, and part two, this is land. This isn't the building. Right. And do we know where that money is coming from? Out of the sky. <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm just, I'm not trying to be silly, but this has got to be a massive multi-million dollar situation. It's a big undertaking. It would require an installment financing to be able to build an EMS station. And it's solely on us, not Mebbin, no, nobody but just us, which Correct. is all of us, the whole county. Correct. Counties are required to provide for emergency medical services. So just for clarification, this action does not require us to build that. It doesn't obligate us to do anything in the next budget year or any time in the future, but it does require the land so that we can do that when we're ready. So you said 1.3 acres. 1.7 acres. 1.7 for $300,000. It's expensive land, and that's uh, a function of the location. We need these places to be close to the interstate close to the bypass so that we can get to where we're trying to get quickly. So it's valuable property. Um, is it close to Ian Yoder? Is this back in there, kind of? Uh, not to give anything away based on my landmarks, but it's close to the ABC store there on South, <laughs> South Third, Third Street, yeah. among many yeah. other parcels. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. You just told us everything. All right. I'm just, I'm just curious. I mean... Uh, do we have a do we have an idea of the size building that you're looking for? So we haven't gone through the design this phase is, yet. Okay, so Roughly this is, this looking for three bays, three gotcha. or four bays. Um, this would accommodate that, um, but we haven't gone through uh, scoping out exactly what building. So in essence, we can buy the we can buy the land. You have plans to put the EMS station on it. But that will be county land. We could do something other, something else if we choose not to do it. Absolutely. We don't have to keep this land. We don't have to build the EMS station there. It's owned by the rescue squad now, and we've had an agreement with them for a period of years to buy this. 
this just moves ahead with that, lets them have the funds so that they can do other things with it and not be tied up in the land. Gotcha. Um, just, just moving forward with the property. So if EMS owns the land, who actually owns the land? So Rescue Squad owns the land, separate nonprofit. Uh, so we are buying it from them. And they wouldn't give us a, a break on the, huh, on, the, on the price because we're friends? I think that <laughs> they would be saying that they would be giving us a break. So we did an appraisal in 2019. This is yeah. the number we got. So I would think the land values have gone up, and I've held to that number. Okay. Rescue Squad is ambulance, right? Sort of, kind of? EMS is ambulance. Rescue Squad is a supplementary, separate nonprofit. They do things like Swift Water Rescue and some specialty rescue services. <coughs> separate operations. <coughs> but they're, you said they're nonprofit, but are they? Publicly owned? No, I'm just going to say publicly owned. Are they are a company that has revenues, has expenses? So they're a separate nonprofit. They have their own funding mechanisms. They're not directly funded by us gotcha. um, or any public body. They, they raise money um, and have their own finances. Okay, thank you. They do get some funding from the county, but not a lot. Is this close to Sandvik? No. All that watch kitty, all that in there? Yeah, yes. Okay. Okay, do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. The second parcel is a piece of property on Alston Quarter Road next to the existing landfill. This would be using landfill enterprise funds, so separate from. Uh, the rest of the county funds, and this would just be a piece of property we would acquire as a buffer. Uh, it's 30.26 acres. Purchase price on that property is $240,000. Uh, we are consistently seeking to add buffer to the landfill, both to avoid future conflicts with subdivisions, with neighbors, and really just to provide flexibility in the future. This is a vacant parcel. Uh, we would be planning to keep it vacant for the foreseeable future keep it in uh, timber um, or farming operations, which provides some significant income for us over the course of time. Right. But it's just a buffer for now. Questions, Mr. Lashley? I have none. Thank you. <clears throat> that is just amazing that 30.6 acres is 240000 and 1.7 is 300000 much, I guess much that slower response time. Location, location, location. <laughs> location Thank you, Thomas. Location, right. That's um. <laughs> wow, that's just. Yeah. That's still I can worth a whole lot. <laughs> no, thank you. That's just. We have a motion. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? I say aye. aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, county manager report. Good evening, commissioners. We have been doing some organizational development um, with policy development. So I have six policies included in the manager's report. Uh, happy to talk about them with you, but it was really just sort of a wanting to keep you informed in terms of some of the needs of the organization and some of the work that the team has been doing internally and then offer the opportunity for any feedback or input that you all might have. So we're hoping uh, to put these into place sometime in August, but wanted to give the chance for the board to also give feedback, and you can do that any way that you're comfortable. Two of the policies came about during our budget meetings where we saw that there were some inconsistent practices with either career ladders or on-call pay, so we've developed a certification policy and an on-call policy to create some consistency across all departments within the organization. Right. And we have money to fund those. These aren't requests for new money or costs that would be incurred. So, um, And then the other four policies are um, trying to develop a supportive culture within our workforce to help uh, employees feel valued and help achieve some balance with work and, um, and their 
personal lives. So we have four different policies that we have found in other organizations around our region that already have them in place. So we're playing a little bit of catch up on those, but also wanted you to have the opportunity to provide input for those. And then the second item within the manager's report is your quarterly uh, financial report uh, that Susan provides. So happy to answer questions on either item, should you have them or if you have any feedback, happy to take that too. Okay. Any questions? Mr. Kerr? Uh, I had some, some questions. The, um, the employee professional certification policy, I, I didn't see any... I didn't see anything in the policy itself that defined what certifications would allow additional compensation. Sure. Would it be helpful to have a list that within each department that qualifies? There we could do be some. have some of those because we've had these career ladders in place, so we do have some of that internally already. We are developing that as we work through this policy and getting feedback from departments as well. So we've vetted these through all of our department directors to help us uh, also work through these for their departments and the relevance for each department. Okay. So it's a little bit vague because the needs vary greatly from department to department in terms of what would qualify for a certification, but we do try to define it as a, an advanced certification or degree that helps further their professional development within that particular job that they have, and there's of course a limit on those to two per year. Do you think that once we sort of go through this process a little bit that, that there will be a certain list within each department later, or do you anticipate it still being a little vague? Well, I think most department heads know what certifications, what professional certifications are available for the jobs that they offer and have a list, but we can continue to hone that with them. It does have to be very relevant to that job. Yeah. So. I mean, to me, it, a little certainty is would go a long way here. That okay. way there won't be confusion about, well, I, I, I spent some time doing this and I'm not getting compensated. Sure. It does have to be pre-approved. It does okay. go through okay. a vetting yeah. process. Right. Okay. Yes. So you can't just randomly decide yeah. sure. to take, I don't know, French and think that that's an yeah. advanced certification. That would not be helpful. Uh, I still think a little certainty might, might be helpful, I mean, okay. as we go forward. And also the... So, it would, when would it become effective would it, we were this hoping, budget year? We were hoping to put these into place in August, but wanted to give some time to fine-tune them, if you will. Yeah, and then and so there's there's money in this year's budget to cover that. So there's that already, already happening within departments are, are career ladders is the right. term that's being used, which is a little bit outdated. Um, and so each department has various... Uh, career ladders for positions and they were compensating them in different rates and ways right. and so this is just trying to create a consistent policy for the whole organization not all positions are eligible to receive a certification so <coughs> it's just trying to create a more consistent um, process and funding for those positions sort of a standardization of those across okay. I, I think that's, that's important uh, the the on-call and the callback compensation, when would that become effective? Again, we're hoping to put these into place in August. Uh, what we're finding is that various departments are doing a variety of different things for on-call and callback. So again, just trying to make sure that everybody is being compensated in the same manner and in the same way. Okay. So it would change the way that certain departments are getting... It, for instance, it might do away with overtime, but, but it might... The overtime might be covered in this. It doesn't necessarily do away with overtime. I don't know if Cheryl wants to get into the technical pieces of it. This is more for if you're sitting home on a weekend because you're on call, so you could be required to report to work, mm -hmm. limit some of the activities in which you could do things, go out of town or whatever. Right, right. So that, that would be a more of an on-call status, which is different than an overtime pay. Okay. What would it apply, for instance, to the, the emergency management uh, like uh, centers that we establish if there's an emergency? So there's a special section in there related to the declaration of a state of emergency and okay. how that's handled. It's a little bit different, but the policy does specifically name that process and single that out. So a little different than just your standard on-call, which is more like 
okay. maintenance or IT right. positions. Because somebody, somebody always services. has to be on call for emergency services, I would guess. Those Absolutely. Yes. Right now, we yeah. already compensate them. So like Heidi yeah. was saying, at certain, um, all departments have something different that we're doing. So this helps standardize, make it to where it's easier across the board. Um, so this would just allow those EM, fire marshal's office that's here tonight, this would allow them to, anyone that's scheduled to be on call would be in compliant with this policy while scheduled to be on call. And if they're called in or called back, then this policy would dictate how that's going to be compensated and versus a career ladder. Do you anticipate providing the actual policies before August for us to look at or no? They uh, should have been in the packet. Okay, these are the policies. Yes. Okay. I, I didn't draft know if you were, format, if yes. you were t tweaking them or if... They're in draft because we're wanting to get feedback. So our departments are working through these, and they knew that they were coming to the board tonight as well. So if you have changes, give me a call or let me know, and I'd be happy to incorporate those. Okay. And the parental leave policy, is that pretty standard now for... Counties Pretty much everywhere has state. parental leave. I think we're proposing four weeks of paid right. parental leave. Um, we see some counties that have well, six, 12, nine weeks. So there's a variety of, of standards. We just thought to introduce this, we would start with the four weeks. Okay. And that's pretty common in the uh, in private. private sector. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Well, Craig went over most of the three of the four things. Uh, the only thing I really have to add is just a question. When the county employee decides to get these certifications, does the county employee pay for that certification, or does the county pay for it? It will depend. Question. It, yeah, so it's going to depend. So a lot of our departments have training budgets, so we're hoping, as part of our performance evaluation program, that those new year goals, as we establish those, that may be to get your certification in X. Um, and if that piece, if that's something that really is a huge benefit to the county, then that would be in their budget to be able to pay for that certification. And then the compensation would be part of the own, um, part of the certification policy. Others may be that it's not really a requirement, but it would enhance what they're able to do for our citizens and for us. And so therefore, we would just compensate them for achieving that certification but not necessarily pay for that certification so it really is going to differ depending on what it is like if they go back to school like for an advanced degree in social work that may be not we don't have a tuition reimbursement program now so that necessarily wouldn't qualify but we would compensate them for that achievement they reached thank you that's good that's it I'm good um, due to the dangerously shortage of detention officers in our jail, what does this do? Because I know they're kind of like on call all the time, and you get this comp time, but if you're never able to take that time off, the comp time is just, it keeps piling up. So is this something that would relate to that and benefit them? It could. It could. Something that the sheriff, so what we're looking at is some people will say I'm always on call, right? Like. Heidi's always on call, but we're saying exempt individuals are not really applicable to this policy. But if there is an on-call schedule where maybe that, I don't think he does this now, but if where he's saying I need three officers to be on call to be able to report back in, um, and he expects them to be back in and they have to come back in, then they would be considered on call. If he has a team of 10 people he's calling and two say I'm out of town, I'm off set schedule, and he goes to the next person, that's really not an on-call scenario. He's just working through like a, trim, um, a phone tree to get someone to come in. But what if that tree doesn't happen? I think that's when he says he's the sheriff. <laughs> 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 or he puts Jackie up there. No. <laughs> what was your question? Like she's talking about this tree, and you can call down this tree. I said, what if this tree isn't there? You keep calling and calling because... <clears throat> But next to many, um, these gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, also have a life outside the jail. And they're just, Sometimes. it's just not their hobby. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm just curious. We normally have an on call supervisor, and we have people on call regardless, you know, every weekend, holidays, et cetera. Sheriff, chief deputies, on call 24 7. And the, and the detention center, because of um, the situation they're in with staffing, they have an overtime situation happening where people can sign up for shifts and there's different compensation to ensure coverage is there. So there's like a different layer in addition to what we have 
that they're doing to ensure the safety of what's happening across the street. But just understand, and I'm preaching to the choir, the more these folks have to come in because there aren't these folks that work there, the more stress that is on that position, which is already a stressful job. I mean, it's not a hobby, and I mean, it's not, I mean, it's kind of like going into military. It's an elite type of situation. It's got to be what you want to do, and you also know what to expect. So, um, yeah, so the policy is not creating more on call. It's just simply compensating employees who are already doing on call in a consistent and standardized way. Well, that's my question because I know we've, we've talked and talked and talked about the salaries for these folks and compensation. I'm, I'm just trying to figure that out. Just wanted to know. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I have one more question, Mr. Mm -hmm. Barr. Uh, has there been any analysis of how this would affect the budget? I mean, there are changes in different ways for different departments, but is there sure. like a universal, we expect the, the impact to be X or Y? We're not expecting a huge impact because they're already being paid in right. a variety of different ways. Right. So we also know that we have a lot of left salary, so we think that we'll be able to pay any of the shortages out of that. When you say not a huge impact, can you quantify that at all? Um, have we, do we have a list of... No, I mean, so we looked at it, so for parental leave, um, we kind of can look at SMLA, who would qualify for that and has had a baby or caregive. So that that's not substantial. Well, we can't, can't right. project can't what's going to happen it. in the coming right. years. Right. Um, for the on-call, um, we already have money budgeted with these career ladders that right. we're bringing in to fund that on-call. Um, and then also for the certification pay, we kind of have that already have some certifications and career ladders. So that's why we were speaking direct. We really don't anticipate, I mean, we'll get a lot of data from this as we roll it out, but we really don't anticipate um, a huge increase. But we don't, I don't have any quantitative data because it's really speculative, speculative at this point. It's, it's kind of hard to see. Sometimes you have to kind of venture to, to see what happens. I mean, we spoke to other counties to see what, what they're seeing and their turnaround. I mean, these policies are pretty common throughout. Like even, I mean, we're, we're a little behind the times in, in what we're doing for employees. Um, they're, I mean, I guess the best way to say that it, it's pretty standard um, what we're rolling out. So I would think it would just, we're gonna work within the budget you guys gave us. So we'll figure it out. Because the certifications, again, if we don't have dollars to fund those certifications, then we're not approving people to have them, and that will have to go in next year's budget. Right. And then on call, we're gonna, we have to keep a good record of what's gonna happen. But we did look at our fire marshal, our EM, our maintenance department, he budgeted money this year. Um, so we, we have looked at that, and we feel confident that those dollars are there. And I don't know, Susan may have additional information. Well, it seems like the biggest risk for the, the most significant budget impact is the on-call. Is that right? Because right. because we're, we're, we've got a whole bunch of different policies and we're combining them into one and it affects different departments differently. Right. So that's the biggest potential risk. Is that it fair? It is, but the way that the policy is written, it's limiting the compensation to like two hours on weekends and one hour for being on call. So we're not talking about incurring significant costs for these, right? Okay. It's the, the hourly rate that they would normally get. Right. Okay. Um, and the other policies don't have a cash value, right. right? Nothing rolls over, nothing gets paid out. If they don't use them, there's no pay for that, right? right. It's just another bucket of leave okay. that's available to them while they're employed. It's basically trying to bring us into a position so we're competitive in the marketplace. I mean, we're, we're dealing with so many competitive issues on salaries and benefits and so forth. And this just kind of brings us into a position so that when somebody's looking at a job at one agency or right. one community or another county, we're on par right. as, in, in as many places as we can be. We're trying to be marketable, right. right, when we're trying to attract employees. I know, Commissioner Thompson, you and I talked about, like, even before I started my job, on ways that we could build a culture that made our workforce mm -hmm. 
more attractive without costing us a lot of money. And I right. think this is a first step in moving in that direction. And and is this, just please correct me if I'm wrong, is this also a way to cover um, folks that we already have employed to benefit them more because yes. we are so short? Yes, right. we think that, that our workforce will see these as policies that enhance their quality of life while feeling supported and cared about as an employee of LMS County. But yet we're still short. You see what I'm saying? We're doing this for the ones who are constantly there, manning up, always there, no matter what, but we're still short. That's the point I'm trying to get. Sure. Okay. Thank sure. you. Now hopefully with the salary study that we're implementing and the funding that we've put in the budget, we can start working toward bringing that parity on salaries up with some of the agencies that we're losing people to right now. So. Okay, um, Mr. Stevens, I think you have somebody you want to introduce to us. Yes. I think that's all for you, isn't it, Heidi? That is all for me, sir. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I think you have somebody you want to introduce to us tonight? I do. I have a closed session I'll motion, but, but, but for her step in, so. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, closed session motion, but first I want to introduce to the board and to the community Michelle Ford. Michelle is joining us um, starting tomorrow. She has 20 years of legal practice, most recently worked for the city of Burlington as assistant city attorney, and she's coming on with us tomorrow. And we can't be more excited than we are to have her on board. Uh, to have another oar in the water for me is great. So I'm really excited to have Michelle and thank her for being here tonight. Thank you. My and pleasure. I girl power. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, pursuant to North Carolina General Statute, I ask the board move into closed session to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege. Between the attorney and the public body, the attorney will advise the board on ongoing legal matters, including NAACP at all, the Alamance County at all. I anticipate no action will be returned. Okay. Motion to move into closed session. I have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 We are now in closed session. Okay, we're back in session. Does anybody else have anything else? We cleared no action was taken oh. during the closed session. Did you want to do commission? I do have uh, one comment. I, I, well, it, that's right. We've got commissioner comments. So, uh, Mr. Turner? I'm fine, thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Mr. Lashley? I'm fine, thank you. I just want to give a shout out. Nobody's here to DSS because I've had to work with two really serious homeless situations and they have been phenomenal wow. in their service and I cannot thank them enough. I'm not going to mention any names, Great. but I'm very proud of our DSS. They are, they're awesome. Thanks. I have a, a, a comment tonight, tonight that occurred, uh, came to me this morning. Um, one of our appointees to the Board of Adjustments was talking about the number of cases they're working on. So I, I hate I asked you to do this and knowing that our, we, we were going to be here. I thought we, I didn't think we'd be this late. So I'll apologize to you anyway. But uh, since I told you I wanted to make a comment about it, I didn't think we'd be in an empty room. But uh, um, how many hours have y'all put in so far and how many hours, if roughly, just a, a wag? How many hours do you think the, you might be board, putting in? Four members. Each member is in for about 88 hours at this point. And, uh, How many? About 88 hours of uh, meetings, and they're almost at halfway of what we think they're going to do. Oh. We've had 11 meetings, and we think we've got about 12 more meetings to, to wrap it up. So when they committed to, to take every Thursday, that, I don't think they knew what they were getting into. This is a long-haul you know, probably going into to October, um, but it's, it's been really good. Uh, the, the board has been really faithful, uh, and, and it's difficult sometimes because, you know, some of the cases are hard. Uh, you know, you, you've got the, the evidence of the market value, but the person there is concerned about what does this mean for me and yeah. my bill. Um, there are also some wonderful cases where, where somebody will come in and uh, either you get to help them, or they realize, well, that's not as bad as I thought. Now that we have tax rates, we show them what the bill will be with every case. 
and sometimes that's a great relief, sometimes it's not. Uh, but I will say that, that it's nice with the, the county portion of the bill um, is uh, very moderated. A lot of times if it's high, it's, it's another jurisdiction taxing that, that's running high. Uh, but our board has just been wonderful and faithful to, to come and serve. Well, I bet they all board. changed their phone numbers after this. <laughs> it's a volunteer board and they are, yeah. and they are Good dedicated. People. And the comments I've had from the members that I've spoken to on it, uh, they're dedicated to trying to do the right thing for our citizens and we should be really proud of them and we need to give them a thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounding thank you from us. It's, a, it's hard work and it's, in a lot of cases, it's uh, emotional work yeah. for all parties. So make sure they get a thank you from us, if you would. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, with nothing else, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 We adjourn. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.